What I really want to do is I want to have more of a conversation uh, and dialogue with you. And if there's anybody online, I'm going to ask for your help today. We have somebody who's monitoring uh, the uh, Facebook Live right now. And uh, if uh, there is uh, anyone who is uh, 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 watching, I want to pray that and hope that you can contribute. I know that there's, there's somebody watching. There's always somebody watching. But um, I'm going to be asking some questions this morning. And I want you to contribute. And somebody's watching and they're going to share that with the, with the class. But I'm going to be discussing th some things that I think are going to be more beneficial for you if you participate. So I'm going to challenge you out there. Please contribute. Somebody's watching and they're going to share uh, your thoughts and, and uh, because I think it's going to enhance this study. And the title for today's uh, study is The Th Most Difficult Things to Say. And I brought a brief uh, devotional on this to the men uh, last month. And I want to bring it in a more formal setting now about the most difficult things that we uh, encounter in our lives, the things that we have to say. And there are three things that I uh, would tell you that are the most difficult things for people to say, and here they are. Number one, I don't know. Number two, I'm sorry. And number three, I need help. Those are the three in my short life and in my experience as not only as a pastor, but as a counselor and speaking to my wife who, who counsels uh, a full time now, uh, we, when we had a, we had a great conversation over dinner one time and we were talking about these three things and, and my wife affirmed them. She says, I see these things all the time. People who struggle to say, I don't know. And as a result, they continue to walk in blindness. They could blindness. They continue to struggle with their life but they're not willing to admit, I don't know. And in the same way, people who have a, a, a problem apologizing, admitting their faults and saying, I'm sorry, especially to those that they love the most. And we had a really good conversation on that one. Why is it so difficult for people to say, I'm sorry? And of course, the third one is I need help. Uh, and my wife counsels through a company, um, which she has, of course, her independent company, but she also contracts some of her clients through a company called BetterHelp. And it's based on that idea, I need help. And so each of these three things bring their own unique challenges. And not only do they bring their own unique challenges, they bring their own unique problems. If you struggle with any of these three things, you're <coughs> going to face problems, and I would say unnecessary problems in your life. And until you can learn to uh, say these three things without hesitation, and with full uh, understanding that to do so is a demonstration of, of faith and uh, maturity in Christ, you're going to suffer needlessly unless you learn that. And so um, some of you are going to say, I struggle with some of these. And you might say, I struggle with all of these. But I think that when we examine these three statements, we can finally uh, probably find that we struggle with at least one of these. I don't know. I'm sorry. Or I don't need help. The question I would ask you, and it's a rhetorical question right now, because I'm going to ask you to participate, is which one of those do I struggle with? Do I struggle with any of those? And uh, I, I want to hear from each of you which one you struggle with, if it's maybe more than one. And, um, and, and we're going to offer that opportunity. But before we do, I want to first ask the primary question. Oh, by the way, Jose, when they bring the tacos, let me know, so that way... We want Sister Paulina to get first dibs because these guys will take, especially Kurt. And then... I'm taking three. No, he's not taking three. And then uh, let us know. <laughs> okay, anyway, on with the study. Which, by the way, another reason why you need to attend in person. Free tacos. Uh, anyway, I want to hear from each one of you, which one of these three do I struggle with? Or maybe more than one. But let's first ask the primary question, the, the elephant in the room, the big pink elephant. Why are these statements so difficult for people to say? Pride. Pride? Amen. Lack of humility. They're scared, Pastor. I think they're scared because of how, how they were raised and how they grew up. You know, it's, especially as men, um, nothing against women, but men are known to be the protector or the you know the strong the stronghold of the family, and those three things show vulnerability. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Weakness. Right. It's interesting because I had three things written down, and the first one was pride. But my wife has also counseled people and found that for some of them are right along with what, and Stephen, thank you for sharing that. For some of them, it's fear. And you might say, well, isn't that tied to, to, to pride? But some people have been taught growing up that to show this is a sign of what? Weakness. Weakness. And they've been raised to think that if I demonstrate I don't know, if I demonstrate that, that, that I'm sorry, that if I demonstrate that I need help, that there are repercussions and in some ways punishment for what they've experienced in their life. And so they're afraid. So sometimes it's pride and many times it's pride. In fact, I'm going to read to you a passage. Uh, many times it's fear. And there's another one that identified. Anybody else? And by the way, I want to credit my wife because much of this is based on her experience and her expertise. And she is an expert, of course, uh, in her field. So uh, I, I, I want to give credit where credit is due. Pride. Um, fear. It also indicates that you people think you're dumb. Mm. So you're, that's the fear, right? The fear that people are going to mock you or think you're you're foolish if you say I don't know, or they're going to think you're weak if you say I'm sorry. You know. Yeah. Um. I. Well, the portion of I don't need help is like you like to. Maybe someone's a perfectionist or controlling, and like I want it done this way though. I don't. Because if you help me, you're going to do it wrong. Or like. Yeah. So it's a fear. It's a fear that if you if you reach out for. For help that that they won't do it right, and I, I struggle with that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. brother. I think uh, Steve mentioned yeah. the word, and uh, he was saying, you know, for men, a lot of times he mentioned the weakness, but he also mentions it also may show vulnerability. And as a man, being, you know, especially being a, a Christian man, right, and and knowing that we're supposed to be the head of the household, uh, sometimes that that's a struggle because you you feel that you have to you're going to carry the weight not of what just you do but of that of your family and so that's a that's a pressure that amen a lot of us carry out there too. i'm going to credit val for for the for discovering the third one um and and i think what you're speaking on is exactly what the third one was uh ignorance well, what do you mean by ignorance nobody's ever taught some people what to do when they don't know what to do when when they've made a mistake, what to do when they need help. They don't know any better. They didn't have somebody to train them up and so forth. And so I was raised by a very, very strong uh, father figure. And my father never said, I don't know. My father never really said, I'm sorry. Uh, there were a few times when very, very few occasions. And it was almost like he was cornered to do so. And he definitely, definitely never said, I need help. But he was that that traditional, uh, you know, that Mexican machismo, the, the man is tough. And I remember my dad would say, men, real men don't cry. And so if I cried when I was a kid, hey, men don't cry. And so, and I don't fault my dad. My dad was taught that way by my grandpa. And I'm sure my grandpa was taught like that by my great grandpa. And so many times the things that we've been taught growing up builds us up in ignorance. And we're operating in ignorance in this idea that as men, for example, hey, this is my responsibility and there's things that I can or can't do. And so in these three things, I think that we find ourselves uh, struggling to say these three things. I don't know, I'm sorry, and I need help. And where it really suffers is when you begin to immerse yourself in relationships. Sister? The other thing is your, your, your children are always is supposed to look up to the parents. Ah. And as they grow up, they they, they we know everything. Yes. We know an answer to everything. You know, that's why I think it's another problem. That's a very important point because when the kids are little, hey, mom and dad, they have all the answers. They're, they're awesome, right? Superman, superwoman. But then all of a sudden, when they reach the teenage years, we, we've studied this money and I, of course, in, in growth and development. Uh, human growth and development tells us that in the early teen years, they begin to kind of look for their own identity. They go into this identity phase, right? Their own. their own identity. They want to look for themselves. Okay, I've, I've been raised under the identity of my parents, and now I'm trying to find myself. But in that phase can become, there can come a rebellious phase. Anybody here had to deal with uh, teenagers? No, or, never. Uh, no? Okay. 
that rebellious phase happens when they begin to realize that my parents aren't perfect. They don't know everything. They don't know everything that they make mistakes. And all of a sudden, they begin to say, okay, my idea of this world where the mom and dad, they just knew everything. They begin to question things and they begin to seek themselves. So thank you, Connie. I think that's ex extremely important. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. I think we agree, I agree with that, brother, but it kind of comes in phases, right? So as a child, you, you do believe that. As an as a adolescent... You, you think you know you think you know everything yeah and then as we get older we look back at our parents and they they were awful smart yes that's the the cycle the cycle is that when they begin to go into the same circumstances they have their own kids they go into the real world they begin to to realize that the wisdom that they heard from their parents if their parents did their job right they'll come back train no child in the way that, she, that they should go and when they are older, they will not turn away from it. That's why. That's the the the, the, the cycle of that. We always tell them that too. Whenever they confront us, well, wait till you have your children. Yes. <laughs> yes. Why you're getting disciplined and so forth. Amen. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Lord has a way of humbling us all that way. I know that I had my moments when I, um, when I realized how wrong I was with things. I mean, because my father was a wise man. My father was a wise man. And he would tell me things. And it wasn't until I got older, I was like, oh, okay. And I remember one of the first things he told me um, when I first got married, he said, he said to me, he says, you're, uh, uh, he says, you're going to find out that life isn't about you. And amen to that. <laughs> he told me that. And, and I think it's right because when you start having kids and you start having to sacrifice yourself and give of yourself, my, and that's one of, the thing, one of the things I can say about my dad is that that uh, it was his money was not about him buying stuff. He always denied himself first it was always for his family he was a provider a really true provider and so um i think that our parents can teach us these kinds of things if if we're willing to learn from that so first peter five five to seven everybody there somebody read that five to seven yes verses five through seven <clears throat> likewise you who are younger be subject to the elders clothe yourselves all of you with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the point of time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Amen. Be sober. Oh, that's it. Okay, yep. sorry. That's okay. Notice the beginning. I love that. In the same way you who are younger, submit yourself to your elders. I mean, it's kind of fitting what we talked about, right? How the way we were raised. But clothe yourselves with humility. Why does it, he say, just be humble? Why does it say clothe yourselves with humility? Think about the theological implications of that. Um, to say, dawn humility over your life rather than just be humble. Um, I think that um, when it comes to an outfit, there's different portions. Mm -hmm. um, this morning, it's, it's <laughs> I don't want to hear about your outfit options, <laughs> sister. <laughs> no, no, no. I was going to say this morning, I literally woke up with him saying to me, take your portion. Literally, I woke up. I said, the Lord just gave me this word. He said, take your portion. And um, I think that you're, it, you're selecting your, your different areas, right? So an outfit takes different, different areas. Okay, yeah. so I think it's easy to get up in the morning and put on yourself, your normal okay. self, and be prideful and 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 go about doing your own. Do you stuff. have to put on your prideful self, <laughs> or is that already your naked self? Yeah. Right, yeah. your naked self is prideful, self-serving. Me, right. me, me. I want. Now, you don't have to put that on. That's already you. Yeah. And so when. When Peter says, uh, put on, clothe yourselves with humility, like you said, you, you, when it says, clothe yourself with Christ, clothe yourself with humility, it's not part of your nature. And we have to put that on every single day. Look at the armor of God in Ephesians. Put on the armor of God. Well, why? Because it's not natural to you. And so it's so important that you understand that when we look at these three most difficult things to say, 
that you understand, I don't know, I'm sorry, I need help, are not natural to you. They're not natural to you because it goes against uh, pride. That's natural to you. It goes against fear. Did you know that the most common instruction, the most common instruction in all of scripture is do not fear. Did you know that? And it goes against our ignorance because we are ignorant creatures. And I like, oh, Pastor called me ignorant today. That's great. I'm glad I came to Sunday school. Uh, but, but, with, but who are we? As smart as we think we are, who are we compared to the wisdom of God? We have to humble ourselves to that. I don't care how much we think we know. And, 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 and so I think that these things uh, teach us about how important it is to grow up in Christ acknowledging. And if you can learn to say those three things, I don't know. I'm sorry. I need help. You will grow up in maturity in Christ. And brother, keep monitoring. Let me know if there's any comments, okay? So let's look at the first one more specifically now. I don't know. Who struggles with this one? I don't struggle with that one, brother. I say it all the time. Yeah, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> sit here. I, I struggle with that one. I struggle with that one. And I'll tell you why. Because I feel uh, obligated and responsible for you. And I feel responsible to my family. And just like Val said, as a, as a parent, I need to have the answers. I need to have the game plan. And I'm a planner. I, I, I have to. And so if I'm in charge of a flock, if I'm in charge of a company and with employees and they come and they ask me questions, I have to sometimes say, I don't know, but let's find out. But it's hard for me sometimes because I don't want people to lose faith in me. I don't want people to say, well, oh, pastor doesn't know. Or, hey, if dad doesn't know. Hey, if the boss doesn't know. And so I feel like I have this burden on me sometimes. And I feel like, like I have to carry all this stuff. And Marco will tell you, because he's with me almost all day at the business, I get text messages, phone calls from all over. I mean, <clears throat> I'm constantly being interrupted. I'll have dozens of clients call me with an insurance question. I'll have uh, uh, people from the church call me with, with, with a counsel. Uh, my kids will reach out to me. And I feel like I sometimes have to have all the answers. And to learn to say, I don't know, is liberating for me. To say, you know, I, I don't know. And then sometimes my family, I'm going to pick on my family here sometimes. We'll be having lunch or dinner, and then some random question will come up. Hey, did you know that there's different kinds of rabbits that there's somebody? Hey, Dad, what is the common uh, uh, common uh, uh, mating season for European rabbits? I don't know. Why are you asking me about there? What's the common uh, wingspan of the European seagull? Why are you asking me these random questions? Did you know? <laughs> yeah, uh, but sometimes I have to remember that that uh, I can't have the answers for everything. Oh, tacos are here. So, brother, go ask Sister Paulina first. <laughs> go with me to James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Any questions, comments, while we're going to James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8? Pastor, you know what, what's funny is uh, I've, I've learned to say I don't know very quick with my wife because she... I love her to death, but she has so many questions, and, and I feel like I'm, I'm the know-it-all. You know what I mean? Like I agree with as, that. As we're watching something, and she's like, "Oh, these." So what? What? What do you know about these fire ants? I'm like, I, I don't know. Like, it's, uh, yeah, Good I'm morning, the expert. You know, and I think I've learned in the beginning of our relationship. I was that guy to say, "Yeah, it's because this, it's because this," or I'll, I'll look it up. And I'll get back to you. You know, and. Like you said, how liberating it was to say, yeah, sorry, man, I don't know. I don't know. It's okay. Now, you can say, I don't know, but but uh, let me find out, right? It doesn't mean that we can't find the answer. Or you just said it. You just said it right there. Because we're not always going to have the answer, you know? And and something, you know, you learn in corporate America right away is, you know, that's a great question. Let me take that back or let me go and find out or you know, let me think about this and then I'll get back to you. There's nothing wrong with that. Does everybody hear that? that. Yeah. There's but nothing wrong with that. You know what? I think the reason is because people that don't want to look ignorant, or that, uh, it's about the image. What are you going to think about me, right? Yeah. If, if I say, I don't know, especially I see from the teaching uh, education background, you know, if a student asks a question and the teacher doesn't know, I mean, 
you know, you don't want yeah. it to 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 give that impression that oh my goodness. I, I would I would rather have someone yeah. tell me, you know, I don't know. Right. Let me think about that. Let me get back to you then. That's tell me something off the top of their head that you know because you know what when you do that too folks can tell yes and now how do you look right? you, if you're afraid of looking foolish if you're afraid of looking foolish the worst thing you can do is to guess or to act like you don't know and then be found wrong so a great technique that I always use, especially when I was a teacher, is like, okay, who knows here in the group, right? And then everybody will go like, okay, you know. So, like, you're teaching the class, somebody asks a question, go, that's a great question. Before I answer it properly, yeah. what, what do y'all think? <laughs> yes, yeah, there you go. They got to learn yeah. Man, I just figured, see, I cracked your code. Okay. Yeah. Just, we've all been saved by Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's look it up. Dr. Google. Yeah, Dr. Google. You know, <clears throat> um, and oh, by the way, there's tacos back there. So if you want some, please grab. There's plenty of tacos for everybody. So go, go grab you a taco while, while we're doing the study. Um, James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, what does it say? You should ask God. See that? Who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. You want to demonstrate unstableness? You want to uh, demonstrate inconsistency? Try relying on your own wisdom. Try guessing on answers and acting like you know. We've met people like that. So what happens is that when they actually do know, you doubt that. And uh, I, I love my son Marco because because uh, sometimes we'll be we'll be talking about things and I'll make a comment and he's a fact checker. He's got his phone right Google, so I'll say something. He goes ah, let me let me question that, and I love that. He holds me accountable. He's like you know, and and sometimes I'll be like no you don't you don't need to check it. I'm pretty sure that that's the common wingspan of the European seagull. Yeah, and it's probably wrong whenever you find anyways. Yeah, and then whenever you find it, no no no, that's the wrong website. You have to uh, you know but. But I need to be responsible. I need to be accountable for what I say. So from the first one, if you struggle with I don't know, remember James 1, 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. And, and you're saying, well, wait a minute. Are you saying that if I want to find the common wingspan of the European seagull, I need to ask God? No, what it's saying is ask God for the wisdom and the humility to say I don't know. You're saying that there's wisdom in saying I don't know? Yes. 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 When you begin to understand that, just like Val said, that I don't know is a display of wisdom, then it'll be easier for you to say that. So if you struggle with that, please keep that in mind. Questions or comments before we go, before we go to the second one? The second one's noted. Mm -hmm. Pastor, what did you say about getting a master's degree? Oh. Getting a PhD? <laughs> they give you a bachelor's degree yeah. when you think you know everything. And they give you... A master's degree when you realize you don't know anything. And they give you a PhD when you realize nobody else knows anything either. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I have been humbled in these 12 years of my advanced studies. I have, been so, uh, I have studied under some of the greatest minds, theological minds uh, in the world. I really have. Uh, I studied um, uh, under Daniel Wallace. Uh, I studied advanced Greek under Daniel Wallace. Daniel Wallace is the is the most prestigious, most recognized Greek uh, uh, scholar in the world. And I thought I had a handle on Greek until I studied <laughs> studying under him. I studied under folks that um, I realized I don't know anything, and it was and it was great. It's great to be sitting there just soaking it up from these guys that are just just geniuses. But even they will tell you they don't know anything. Because whatever they do have, they got it from somebody else. And whatever they've retained or gained, it's by the Spirit of God. The, it's interesting to me that the most proficient, the wisest of the scholars that I've ever studied with were some of the most humble men I've ever, and women I've ever studied under. And yet, I've also studied under professors that thought they knew and they really weren't that good. And they were the, some of the most arrogant and some of the most... Uh, uh, haughty uh, people I've ever met. So 
Uh, keep that in mind uh, because it's it's a display of the spirit, brother. And doesn't and doesn't the word teach us that as believers we are to keep a teachable spirit? So the Lord is telling us you're never gonna know everything. And so you should remain teachable until the day you die. Amen. Right. Amen. Let me let me tell you. Let me give you an example of that. The uh, one of the professionals that that I, uh, that Kayla studies with, you know, because uh, I told Kayla I'm not equipped enough to be able to just take you to the level you want to go. I can teach you some of the you know foundational stuff, but so we went to this this man, um, and he was the golf coach at Baylor for eight <coughs> years. Took him to national championships. He played on the PGA Tour. He won the national amateur championship, world championship. He uh, he he played in the Masters. The guy is, and he's still he's in his uh, later fifties, and he's still just an amazing player. And yet he's having a lesson with Kayla one day, and Kayla does something. He goes, "Hey, show me how to do that again. What did you do?" And he spent about five minutes. It was like the lesson was going, and then he paused so that he could. Uh, so that Kayla could show him something that she was doing so that he could learn from it. He's teachable. Here's a master of the sport. And it is. It's that way. I'm going to tell you, no matter how smart you think you are, even a two-year-old child, God can use a two-year-old child to teach you something. And boy, does God not speak through our children sometimes to teach us lessons. Yeah. And so amen to that. I think that, that, um, that that's something that we need to always remember. And so praise the Lord uh, for consistently teaching us and i think i preached on that being teachable and we need to be teachable i think the best way to learn something is to be in front of a class <laughs> and to start giving a lesson and then listening to the people who are in your audience i have my pen i learned more that way <clears throat> anytime i ever gave a class i learned more that way than i ever did try to do it on my own amen i always have a pen here because i know that somebody's going to say something i need to write down and then I take it with me and, and I go at it. Remember, I have my, my bread in the oven for my, ooh. And then I go and I put it, I, I add it to the bread, add a little, you know, flavor to it. So amen to that. The second one, the second one is, that was I don't know, right? The second one, I'm sorry. Be honest and humble yourself right now. Who struggles with this one? Okay, we have only three. Some of you are lying. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, no. Why? And by the way, I have my hand up. Why is I'm sorry so difficult? I don't have a problem saying I'm sorry a lot of times. Just meaning it? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> it's the heartfelt sorry that is hard to come to. There's two types of soul, kind of like, I'm sorry, I don't want to argue anymore, whatever, right. you yep. know, that kind yep. of thing. Or, I'm sorry I made you feel that way. But, and the really hard soul, that I right. really feel that, that, I, was, that yeah. I did Profound, something profoundly wrong. Profoundly right. did something to offend you, hurt you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that are really hard for me. Mm -hmm. When we say, I'm sorry I made you feel that way, we're really not being accountable for what we did. It's like, I'm sorry my actions made you feel that way. It's almost like putting it back on the... It's almost like a back, backhanded apology. You know, um, some of us are afraid, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to speak from my experience. I struggle sometimes to say I'm sorry, or at least I used to really struggle with it, was because it made me feel vulnerable. And I felt like, man, here come the quivers and the arrows, and, you know, uh, and, and, and I felt like they would, you know, like... I knew it, you see, whatever, and then I've already exposed myself, I've already made myself vulnerable. But <clears throat> but when you're able to acknowledge your faults and your weaknesses, it doesn't make you weak. In many ways, it strengthens you, especially to those people who love you most. It makes you trustworthy. It makes you capable of being reachable by another person. But if you're with a person that's not willing to say, I'm sorry, why in the world should we expect it from other people? We sometimes demand things from others that we're not willing to give ourselves. I'm sorry. That's a difficulty. Now, uh, this used to be a really big problem for me, and it and it ceased to be that case in 2009. Friday, October 23rd, 2009, God broke me like in no way I had ever seen. And since that day, really, praise the Lord, and I say this to the glory of God, I've never really struggled to say I'm sorry. 
Uh, my kids will tell you, Marco is here, Kayla will tell you. I don't hesitate to come to them and say, Marco, I'm sorry for the way I spoke to you uh, earlier today, or Kayla, I'm sorry for this or that. I'll come to Monty and say, I'm sorry. And like, and, and like Monty says, one of the things that I, that I like to do is to say, this is what I did. That we actually define it and say, this is the wrong that I hurt you. Because if we just say, I'm sorry. Somebody could say, sorry for what? I don't know, whatever I did that made you mad. That's not an apology. That's just, I don't want to fight anymore, like Monty says. But if you can name it, you talk about name it and claim it, that's uh, the right way to name it and claim it. Not name it and claim it as in faith, uh, uh, you know, to just declare it. No, God's will, right? But if you want to name and claim anything, name and claim your faults. Name and claim your sin. Name it and say, yep, that one's mine. Because then you can seek forgiveness. Uh, Pastor, I, I, um, I used to struggle with this horribly, but now I think I'm, I'm, I'm working on it as I grow with Christ. Um, knowing when to say I'm sorry. Because there's times where you're in the heat of the moment, and you're like, fine, I'm sorry. Versus, okay, let me take back, you know, gather my thoughts a little bit, think about what I did, and then say, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry I did that earlier. Anybody else? Thank you, brother. That's that's very wise words because if you just say, all right, well, I'm sorry. Fine. Are you happy now? Well, no, not really. Uh, uh, it, it has to be heartfelt and it has to be genuine. And, 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 and so that needs to be taken time because it shouldn't just be thrown out there. A genuine I'm sorry is something that, that uh, uh, may take time and take prayer to do. But uh, go with me to 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. And again, any of, any of you who are online, I'm encouraging you, please uh, join in, send in a remark, a comment or whatever. We've got somebody monitoring and we'll be happy to share it because we do, we do want to hear your thoughts. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Somebody read that, please. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from our unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I want you to think of the theological implications of what just was said here. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But notice the second statement. If we, I want you to think about this. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, John. If we confess our sins, what if we don't confess a sin? I mean, we're already saved by the blood of Christ. Let's say I'm a genuine believer. I've genuinely repented and I've uh, 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 received Christ and I'm going along and, and we all still continue to sin. We continue to, to stumble, right? But what if I don't confess it? What if I don't acknowledge it? Are you saying that he won't forgive us those sins? What it's saying is is that the Lord will allow that sin to fester in you and to create strife in you like a thorn until finally you're able to see it and acknowledge it. And he doesn't do it because he's a mean God. He doesn't do it because he doesn't love you. He doesn't do it because he can't remove it from you, but he's doing it so that he can purify you and he can refine you and teach you to see yourself, to examine yourself, and to teach you to confess your sin before the Lord. So I can tell you with experience that there have been things that, that maybe some things that I refused to acknowledge even though I knew it was a sin. And there were things that I didn't really see or understand at that time. But that God allowed to, 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 to stay there. Now, it didn't mean that he removed his salvation from me. It didn't mean that, that I wasn't saved. It meant that God was allowing those errors in my life to, to do their work in me to refine me in a way that I could finally look at myself and say, Lord, forgive me for what I've done. I see my sin for what it is. And we have to learn that when we say I'm sorry, it comes from self-examination. It's, it's to say I'm sorry is one of the most uh, mature things that we can say because it reveals a genuine I'm sorry. It reveals our ability to see ourselves. And that's one of the most difficult things to do. My wife is a counselor, and she will tell you that one of the most difficult things with people is their ability to see themselves. Just a real quick example. When we counsel couples, 
and we begin to hear, you know, the, the, the wife is upset because the husband's doing these things or not doing these things, and the husband's upset because the wife isn't who, whatever. One of the first things we do is like say, well, okay, thank you for sharing your hearts. Let's let's begin with this. Obviously, y'all been married for how long? Oh, four or five years, six years. Okay, okay. So by now, you should know what a husband is and what a wife is. So tell me in your words, define for me uh, what a husband is, and we'll ask the wife. You've been a wife for now five or six years. What what is a wife? The look and the slap and the go. And it's almost without it with, without fail they'll do this. Well, I know that I'm not the husband I need to be, or I know I'm not the wife I need to be. Immediately they begin to examine that question from a new lens. And they've either ignored it or haven't thought about it. But when they begin to say, okay, well, I know the answer, but if I give the answer, it's going to reveal that I'm not that person. So when we say, I'm sorry, we're acknowledging that we're not who we need to be. But that, but that, that reveals maturity and insight. So don't be afraid to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry is a way that we can acknowledge that we see ourselves for who we are. And whoever you say that to will respect you for it. And, and we'll, we'll see you in a way that's lifted up. And, and remember, you expect the same from others. And not everybody's going to give it to you, and now you know why. Some people are just not mature enough to do so. Questions, comments? I would say when I first gave my life to Christ, um, it, was, um, it was a heavy conviction of just everything. Because, you know, I wasn't walking with the Lord before, so there was a lot of things that... I might have said to someone um, that the Lord showed me, hey, when you said this, you might have meant it like this, but they received it like this. And he apologized for that. That really hurt them. And so one by one, I started just asking the Lord to show me. And um, one specific conversation with a cousin that I had, I apologized to her. And I mean, she literally was like, you don't know how much that means to me. Thank you for for saying that to me because I was very hurt. She goes, I, I forgave you. Um, you know, I, I, I forgave you a long time ago, but the, um, but thank you for that. But then she said something that I could still sense, like she wanted to kind of like, there was still a little pain in her because of her comment she made, but I said, that's okay. You know, all that matters is, you know, everything moving forward. And um, after that, we had a great conversation and we hadn't talked in so long because just life is busy, you know, but um, after that moment, it kind of motivated me to even apologize even more about other things, including my mom and the things that I put her through and just, um, just anybody in my lifetime that I could think of that I was wrong about. And the devil could no longer hold that against me. That was the most powerful thing is that when it came to confession and like, you know, I need to speak on this and, and tell this person this, um, the devil can hold our sin against us like as an accuser. And you can just say, no, oh, well, it's irrelevant now, it's in the past, but, but the devil is so sneaky, he'll bring it up. So you don't give him that authority over you and you just, for me, and this is just for me, right? Um, I don't know about you guys, but for me, the Lord told me, well, if you confess it, and then now you have taken back that authority. You don't need um, him to keep accusing you. Amen. Verse 9 here when it says, if we confess our sins, that's very liberating. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. He points out the main problem with people and marriages is communication. Mm -hmm. They have to talk to each other or they're going to be over. Amen. That's the whole, the whole life. Amen. And that was the one problem I think with the, uh, our parents generation. They didn't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Everybody just went on their way and you know, supposedly did what they're supposed to do. But nobody discusses I mean in his case I remember. And uh, I think that and that's what if we know, as we all know, that's what destroys these marriages. Yes. These young people. <clears throat> yes, thank you, sister. I think that when John says, if we confess our sins, the act is you take what you've done and you put it on God's altar. You let God judge and condemn it and then cast it away and you're free of it. So when you talk about how the devil holds that over us, it's because we're still carrying it. But if we confess our sins, we release ourselves of it. We put it on God's altar and let him judge it and condemn it and cast it away. And there's something liberating about that. So uh, just remember to say I'm sorry is 
one of the greatest acts of love that you can you can you can give and don't be afraid to do so the third one I need help how many of you struggle with that one? anybody say we got more hands up on that one why do you struggle to say I need help Mm. But but is it I'm controlling as in if I if I say I need help I'm admitting or maybe revealing that that I don't have everything together I don't have everything in control weakness, weakness. it's a weakness a, an idea of weakness or I want everything to do this way and if you're not going to do it this way. Yeah. Or it's like, like, let's say you, you, you ask someone to do this, this, this thing, and then it's like, okay, I'm gonna put you mm -hmm. in charge of that, and then if they mess up, you beat yourself. You're like, I know I shouldn't have. <laughs> yes. Now that I relate to. I struggle to ask for help, and I don't know how many times my wife is constantly telling me, "You need to ask for help. You need to ask for help." And how often I go, "Okay," and then I look and I go. That's not done. So now i got to go and fix it, repair all the damage, and then do it myself. How's that working out? And finally, after a while, my wife's like, you know what? Just just do whatever you want to do. And I tell her, but but there's something that I, that I also, I think, uh, comes into it that, that I want to touch on that I want to see if somebody can figure out. I just want to mention, I think, I, think there's a, I think there's a time when you need to ask for help, and then I think there's a time when... You probably don't need to ask for help. And I, here's what I'm going to say. And this is why I'm saying. Okay, this. you're probably heading to where I was wanting to go. Am I? I'm, I'm sorry. No, no. I'm wanting somebody to figure it out. Because I'm like, so I, I think about how I am, right? And there's many things that go on where I'm like, you know what? I don't want anyone's help. I want to, I'll do it because, again, it goes back to, I, I feel like, you know what? I'll do it the way I think it needs to be done. In my mind, I'll do it the right way. It may not always be the right way, but to me, it was like, this is the right way to do it. So I'll do it. And then, but the thing is, is what happens is you come across something, and, I, and I'll take, I'll give you an example. The sound system that we have sitting up on that platform. I mean, if I, if, if I had hair on my head, it would all be gray right now. Because that just, for months. Oh, God. Right. And I, and, but the thing is, I, 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 I made so many trips back to, back and forth to the audio and visual people trying to figure this thing out, right? But I was like, I, I'll do it, I'll do it, right? But there will be times where you try and try and try and, and for whatever reason, it's not coming together where you need to humble yourself and go, you know what, I need the help. I'm gonna need the help. So the, I think the key is acknowledging when and when yeah. not to. Yes, and I would add, not just acknowledging that you sometimes need help and sometimes, hey, you just got to push through it. It's given to you. And then sometimes acknowledging that you need to know who to ask for help. How often have you asked the wrong people for help? And you're like, oh, that, 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 that didn't work out so good. Jesus asked for help. Jesus asked for help. When Jesus was overcome with grief and sorrow and the imminent arrest, torture, and I mean torture, you know this, and the crucifixion that was about to fall upon him, this cup of God's wrath. Jesus asked for help. How? Pray. Through prayer. He asked Peter, James, and John, please pray with me. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, and they're out there praying for him. Of course, he's like, yeah, but they fell asleep. Yes, but the point is, is that, that Jesus, came like, hey, come on, man, you wake up. Can you pray, not pray for me or with me? But the point is, is that Jesus, the God man, the one who was perfect in every way, asked for help. Jesus incorporated and used others around him. He didn't do everything himself. Whenever they were baptizing in the, in the Jordan, it says very clearly that Jesus wasn't baptizing but that the disciples were baptizing under his authority. He wasn't doing everything. He was delegating. When he sends out the 70, he doesn't go knocking on every door. He sends out, he trains up, and that's a model for leadership. He trains up and, and, and this discipleship, and then he equips them to go and do the things that, we, that, that they're called to do. That's leadership. And so 
easy example. Last night we had an amazing event, amazing event. I didn't do hardly any of it. I mean, I, I bought hot dogs, but Kurt cooked them. I mean, I was around, but everybody else planned. Everybody else did the, this amazing work. I don't have to have my hand in everything. And some of us need to humble ourselves to allow other people. Now, this is, again, speaking on couples. We've heard people, for example, my wife and I were counseling this one couple where the wife had complete control of the money and did not want to relinquish it. She would give her husband uh, like, like a, a little uh, allowance. And the husband's like, I'm the one working. I'm the one making all the money. And, and, and she's like, yeah, but you're not good with the money. And my wife and I were speaking to them. And we're like, you know, uh, it's okay sometimes that some people are stronger in one area than the other. And, and maybe, you know, for example, my wife is really good with accounting. And we trust each other, work together. We rely on each other's strengths. But when it became controlling, when it became, I, I, I'm the authority over this, it created strife in the relationship. So Mahdi spoke to this, this, this woman. She said, you have to understand that submit to your husband has a lot of fear entailed in it for people who aren't ready to do so. But you, but, but there's, there's a cost, there's a sacrifice to it. Because to submit to your husband means to relinquish things that maybe you want to have control of. And she said, yes, but I'm afraid that if he does this, if he has a hand in it, that he may mess things up. And Madi said the most amazing thing. She said, it would be better to allow him to mess it up so he can learn and you can grow and develop so he can learn his role. But he will never learn his role if you never relinquish yourself of it. So we have to allow people to fail sometimes in order to grow. Yes, for those of us who, like, for example, I'm a type A personality. I like to have control of things. But if I want to control everything and I want to do everything, we've seen pastors like this in churches. We've seen leaders like this in business. They want to do everything. They micromanage everything. How can people grow up and develop? Sometimes you have to allow people to stumble. Guess how we learned what we learned how to do? Have you ever messed up and, and that mess up, it was part of your development? Yes. But sometimes even with our kids, we don't want our kids to mess up. We want to we want to baby them and protect them. Hey, how did you learn? We have to allow our kids, our friends, our family members to mess up sometimes. And that way they'll grow up. So we have to relinquish this, this whole idea of I need help. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 9 through 10. And we'll close with this. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 9 through 10. They asked the, 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 the richest man in China, Chinese multi-billionaire. Billionaire with a B. What was the secret to success? And the man said, it's really simple. I surround myself with people who are better than me, smarter than me, and more effective than me. And the reporter started laughing, and the billionaire looked at him and goes, I ain't joking. I surround myself with people who are smarter than me, better than me, and more effective than me. The secret is to acknowledge your limitations and then find people who will, will, will um, balance you out in that. And that's the beauty of marriage. The beauty of marriage is that God doesn't give you somebody that's got the exact same qualifications and skill set that you have. He brings somebody that can balance you well. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 10. Somebody read that. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity, but pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. How many times do you see help? Right? I need help. That's that's a that's a, a, a language you need to learn. I need help. Because if one of them falls down, the other can help them up. But the other can't help them up if they don't ask for help. And how often we carry this burden quietly, trying to act all strong. How many times somebody come up to you and said, Hey, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm great. And inside you're dying, inside you're not doing well at all. You're actually not doing great at all. You just put on a smile. Everything's great. And you're not great. And of course, you have to be smart who to reveal that to, right? You don't want to say that to like the post office worker or something like, okay. you know. But the point is, is that you have to be willing to ask for help. And it's not a sign of weakness. It's a, it's a sign of maturity, faith in other people. And pe there are people, I'm going to tell you this. I want to, I want to lift up uh, the leaders in this church. I want to lift up the deacons. Uh, I want to lift up uh, my, uh, my friends and family that are here. I want to lift up my brother Mark, who helps me preach, that whenever I ask for help, they're quick to jump up and say, I'm here. I want to thank you all, all of you,
who are so important to helping this ministry and this church succeed. Those of you who don't know or are new to this church, you, you have no idea how many hands are collaboratively at work here. And I, I praise the Lord for that. So remember, I need your help is a sign that you trust others. And you'll honor people with that. Okay? I don't know. I'm sorry. I need help. Pray on those three things. And, and ask the Lord to strengthen you and give you the wisdom to be able to say those things when the time is right. Amen? Let's go to the Lord. Lord Father, thank you for this study and the reminder, Lord Father, that uh, our weakness only, only illuminates your strength. That we not be afraid of what we don't know. That we not be afraid of, of our mistakes. That we not be afraid of, of our weakness when we need help, when we're wrong, when we don't know. But to know, Lord and Father, that you, you call us to be humble and to acknowledge that we can't know everything that we can't be perfect and that we can't do everything. And Lord Father, I just pray, Lord, that in this we can learn to continue to be more like you call us to be. Lord, strengthen us to be able to say, I don't know, to be able to say, I'm sorry, and to be able to say, I need help. Praise you, Father, for your word and your wisdom. May you continue to guide us in our path. Be with us in this worship. In Jesus' name we give thanks. Amen. Amen. Bless you.